To become a great investor, you really have to learn from the world's best investors. You need to understand how they think, how they construct investment frameworks, and how they execute trades and manage their positions. At Real Vision, we interview the world's investing legends to find out how they do things. You see, what makes an investment rock star is that process and that framework and that critical thinking. In this masterclass series, we interview the best of the best. Many of these interviews were filmed a few years ago now, but that doesn't mean that you need to concentrate on whether idea is right or wrong. The idea behind this is to learn how they think. It's listen to what they do, not the investment ideas that they were bringing at the time. And that's the key takeaway. Mark, finally got you here, because I've always wanted to interview you for the Masterclass. Oh, I think you've had a fascinating it. career and some great insight. And a lot of the people we've interviewed so far are kind of hedge fund guys, but right. you've been around the hedge fund industry, yes. invested in it, and understand it better than pretty much anyone I know. So I think it's going to be interesting. No, thanks for having me. Um, I think best thing, talk a, bit, a little bit about what you do now, and then yep. we'll talk a little bit about your, your background. Yeah, so you know, today, Morgan Creek is, is a pretty simple construct in that we're a allocation firm, a registered investment advisor that tries to bring the endowment model of investing to other investors, whether it be institutions or individuals. And what does that mean? It just means that we try to bring alternative investments and integrate them into to portfolios. And that really goes from all the way back in my early career. I mean, I didn't start off to be an investment guy. I started off to be a doctor of all things. And, uh, you sold your soul to the devil. Exactly. Well, you know, biology and chemistry, which I actually think are great training for investing. And we can come back and talk about that later. But, you know, I came out of undergrad, went to business school, got a job in an insurance company. The guy who was doing investments retired. So I was a bond picker um, and managing fixed income. And then I went to an equity shop. And I probably would have stayed there forever, but to go back to the alma mater. And when I went back to Notre Dame, I didn't really know what an endowment was. I just knew I wanted to be back at Notre Dame, and I thought I was going to miss picking stocks and bonds. But what I realized pretty quickly was asset allocation drove returns. You know, you look at, at the money we put in the real estate market after the collapse in 91, 92, you know, we made tons of money. Barry Sternlich wasn't a billionaire back then. He was just this guy who was raising money to go buy distressed real estate assets, and we tonned it. When I left Notre Dame and went down to North Carolina in 1998, you know, the cover of The Economist magazine said, a world of wash in oil. You know, oil was $11. It was going to five. Someday it was going to be free. I'm like, really? Come on. And so I have this rule. If I hear it once, I remember it. If I hear it twice, I write it down. If I hear it three times, I do something about it. So I saw that article in The Economist, remembered it. The next week, Richard Rainwater, cover of Business Week, naked long, $800 million of oil. Tore that baby out, put it on my desk. Two weeks later, three guys trained by Richard come in to uh, um, pitch me on, on buying oil and gas assets. Ding, 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 light goes off. So I take it to the board. Go to the board meeting, and uh, it's my first board meeting. I'm here three weeks in North Carolina, and uh, board says, I said, I want to invest in commodities. I want to put 5% in commodities. I start with 1% to these guys trained by Richard. And the chairman says, Mark, that's the dumbest idea I've ever heard, but if you really want to do it, okay. And uh, it's like, okay, great. So we did, and we put 5% in commodities, and that 5% generated 25% of the endowment's returns the next decade. So it wasn't that we were geniuses. It was just that buying cheap assets at a time when no one else wanted them, when people thought it was the dumbest idea ever, usually works out pretty well. So I learned about asset allocation, driving returns. I also learned about hedging. So in 2000, you know, we had spent a lot of time investing in long-only equities. I started to get nervous that things were looking really frothy, and so said we should start adding some hedge funds. Now, the problem was they had banned hedge funds at University of North Carolina before I got there because Julian Robertson had been a manager, and he had done really well up till 1996, and then he had the tough year. He was down 9%, cover story Business Week, you know, fall the wizard, and the university banned hedge funds. And that was not disclosed in my interview. So I said, you know, we're going to put a lot of money in, into hedge funds because I'm worried about market valuations back in 2000. And uh, when Julian started getting nervous, in fact, I just wrote about that in my letter. And the chance was, well, we can't do any hedge funds. I said, all right, fine. We'll do long, short equity, opportunistic equity, absolute return, and enhanced fixed income. He says, that's just nomenclature, right? I said, yeah, good, as long as we're clear. 
<laughs> so we did, and from that 2000 to 2002, you know, we went to 60% hedge funds from zero, and we were able to be flat when the average portfolio lost a third. So you know, getting hedged was something that uh, I really fell in love with. And so we brought that in 2004 out of North Carolina, out of University of North Carolina into Morgan Creek. Uh, so that's a pretty quick synopsis. Yeah. So talk me through how the asset allocation process changed from when you first started looking at yeah. asset allocation, because it's changed tremendously. It has. And <clears throat> yeah, I think, I think the biggest change, role, and you and I have talked about this a lot, is in the good old days, and since I'm old, I can say the good old days. I just, my son just graduated from college for the second time uh, with a master's degree this weekend. Congratulations. Thank you. And, uh, but um, in the old days, like back when we were looking at Barry Sternlet coming out of JMB, you know, we had six months to isolate the problem that you know, real estate collapsed, looked like there was going to be some opportunity. We had another six months to interview people like Barry and Jay and say, yeah, these guys are really smart. We're going to give them some money. Or, or Bill Sanders, who was forming this new idea of REITs in the United States when it wasn't really a new, or was really a new, new thing. And you know, we had time to get invested. And then you had another couple years to harvest. You fast forward to 2002, you know, with the Enron debacle, and you had maybe three months to kind of interview people and find some ideas and nine or 10 months to harvest. You fast forward to 2009, you had about 11 and a half seconds at the bottom in March to actually make a decision and go buy those bonds at 65 cents on the dollar or else they were going to back to par. And so cycles have shrunk. And I think that cyclical process and, and having to act more quickly has led from, tacti- from strategic asset allocation giving way to tactical asset allocation. I think you have to be much more tactical today and you have to think about the short term or the long term being made up a series of short terms. But that's often not where the returns come from. Short term trading is a harder game. And, oh, for sure. You know, even if we're talking short term in kind of asset allocation world, being yeah. three months, two months, that's a hard thing to do compared to taking a view on yeah. a cheap asset and sticking with it for a number of years. Uh, it is. It, look, all the big returns come from having a variant perception that turns out to be right. You know, Michael Steinhardt. And when you have variant perception, you know it's a variant perception because everyone says you're crazy like my board back in 1998. So, you know, when you want to buy assets from distressed merchant energy companies in 2002, people look at you like you have two heads. But if you do that and you hold it for a period of years, you make big returns. And Jeremy Grantham has a great line, right? He says, you only need one or two big ideas a year. A year, right? Most people are trying to figure out, what do I do every day? And, uh, you know, there's a great line from... uh, um, oh, Soros, he said to, about Byron Wien, he said that, you know, the problem is, Byron, you come into work every day thinking you have to do something. I come into work every day realizing I don't need to do anything. So I only do something when it's special. And I think that ability to step back, to your point, from the day-to-day churning and trading and say, all right, which of these trends or which of these cycles, and even though those cycles are shorter, which are meaningful enough for me to really do something about it and take a big position. And I guess part of it, I think what you're talking about, the the kind of patience element, people have forgotten that. So if the patience element, I see this, you kind of, you could turn the world upside down and say, well, equities are wildly expensive from my viewpoint. So therefore I don't want to be involved. Right. And that's a different way of approaching it. Very different. And I I think to that point, and and again, I'm passionate about this particular point just because I just got done writing about it. Um, in fact, there's this great line that if, if I can't read what I wrote, how do I know what I think? <laughs> so the process of writing, as you yeah, know, when you sit down and you actually have to put it on paper and then show it to people, it actually crystallizes how you, you view the world. Yeah, a lot of time I don't even know what I'm going to write until I sit down and write and it exactly. comes out because it's been you know, stewing in your exactly. head for ages and it comes out and clarifies yeah, it all. Exactly. It's that, that intuition that eventually makes itself apparent. And so if you think about your point, where sometimes you just need to ignore asset classes, and, and that's an active, positive decision. And you know, back in 2000, right? If, if you said, I don't really understand this internet thing. I don't understand these valuations. I don't understand how a company with no earnings but lots of eyeballs can be valued at this level. Now, they ridiculed people 
you know, Julian and Tony Dye at PDFM and Gary Brinson, I mean, they shut firms down because they didn't get it. You know, Warren Buffett was ridiculed back in 2000 and again in 2007 when he raised cash. Little did they know that cash would be a good asset. <laughs> um, but I think that that process of, of really thinking about are there alternatives to the traditional way of thinking about assets, 60, 40 stocks and bonds. You know, back in 2000, yeah, U.S. large cap stocks were very expensive, but you could have bought small cap stocks and did pretty well. You could have bought emerging market stocks and did incredibly well. From 2000 to 2010, U.S. market compounded at negative 1%, okay, real, okay? If you bought emerging market equities, you made 10%. Yeah. That's huge, but you, you were going long something that most people don't spend time thinking about. Today, I think a good example would be Japan. You know, people have been fighting about Japan and, and saying, oh, they're going to implode and they have too much debt. And they do have a lot of debt. And their currency is going to get weaker and weaker and weaker. You and I have talked about this. But the bottom line is their equities are going to continue to go up because they have good companies. They have good in, uh, um, technology. And they're taking that technology and they're taking it out to places like Africa and China and India where they need it to develop that, that emerging uh, market consumer. Yeah, and the cheap currency helps as well. Cheap currency definitely helps. And look, um, I'm not sure of a lot, but uh, I was sitting with Hugh Sloan, a good friend in, in London, uh, on November 11th, 2012, you know, right after Abe San had, had been elected. And he looks at me just like you and I are sitting here, and he says, Mark, the yen's going to be lower the rest of your life. And I went, that's a profound statement, Hugh. And he says, Mark, come on. It was 350 30 years ago. And the fact that it got to 78, I'm surprised any of these companies survived. You know, how do you survive when your currency strengthens that much? But they did, and they got so lean, and they delevered. And today, you have these incredibly lean companies that are now competing on a global basis again, and they have a commitment by both Abe-san and Kuroda-san to weaken that currency. I think that's the single most profound thing I've thought of, just come from you there, is if you can survive at 78. Oh my gosh then any weaker currency means the upside's huge. Un unbelievably huge. I mean, you know, I got really excited about Sony uh, a couple years ago. You know, it hit $9 and everybody's writing it off. And, and I got excited for a strange reason. That my son, for his uh, graduation present, for, uh, wanted a Sony camera. I'm like, no, you don't want a Sony. You want a Nikon or, <laughs> or something. He says, I don't want Sony. They have this cool new, you know, mirrorless you know, LCD. I'm like, Okay, and I checked it out and I go to the store and the guy was like, oh my gosh, I've been wanting to try one of these. Can I just take it out of the box? I'm like, well, there's something here. So, you know, starts to come back a little bit. They start to make inroads. So now the stock's in the low 30s and I just read on Friday people saying it's going to hit 150. <laughs> it's all-time high. So that's a company that was given up for dead and is now circling back around because they survived that period of strengthening. Now you're going to have currency tailwind, and turns out that no one informed the CEO, just like Apple. No one informed Steve Jobs that Apple was a meaningless company. But it went down to really, really low, and now it's ruling the world. Yeah, I had an investment round table in the Cayman Islands we were talking about before, and one of the stocks that came up was Sony, and we just put up the monthly long-term chart of Sony, yeah. and it's this perfect rounded bottom chart pattern. Awesome. It just looks fabulous. Awesome. And I, you know, again, Sony, is a bit of a no-brainer in many respects because it is a great consumer company. And if you believe that there is a growing demographic in various countries where people want to buy this kind of stuff. So well, we're all nostalgic. I want my, I mean, I remember the first Walkman I got. I mean, I, 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 it was like this huge deal. And uh, I would, you know, I, I have loyalty to the brand. You're right. So talk to me a bit about how the hedge fund business changed from when you started investing in hedge funds. Yeah. What did that world look like? Who were the characters and how did they, how did they invest and how's it kind of morphed over time? Yeah, you know, it's, it's, it's really fun again to talk about this particular topic because it's fresh. Um, and you know, I spent a lot of time thinking about, about the hedge fund business and, and in my life and career. And you know, I came out of the uh, asset management, the long only asset management side, came into the university and that was just at the time where universities were starting to think about investing in hedge funds. And, and uh, so I dutifully trotted off to New York and, and met with the handful of players. Because what people forget, you know, A.W. Jones founded this, right? You know, 1949, 
And then 1966, it was the article, you know, he was a Fortune editor, and Fortune wrote the article, uh, the Jones no one keeps up with. And, but what happened is that attracted everybody into the industry from 66 into 72, and then boom, the 73, 74 wipeout occurs, and 85% of them went out of business because they didn't hedge. That's where we lost the D. It used to, when A.W. Jones called it hedged funds, and then the D got lost from 66 to 72, um, and then boom, they went out of business because they were just levered long. So you had a handful of people. You had Soros, you had Steinhardt, you had Robertson, and Julian, you know, if you think about it, by starting his fund in 1980, you know, kind of post that crisis, he came in and really single-handedly from 80 to 86 may have saved the hedge fund business as we know it today because he was the one that they called the Wizard of Wall Street. And he was a great stock picker and suddenly hedge funds were hot. Now, there were still only about 20 or 25 of them that you could even invest in, less than a billion dollars of total assets, if you can believe that. And uh, so I start looking at him in the early 90s and now Tiger's been around 10 years, and there's a few other new ones, but still not very many names out there. And there were some bigger macro guys who had kind of spun out of the, the Soros crowd, and there were a few event-driven guys who had spun out of Goldman Sachs. You know, had Farallon starting and, and a number of those, and Richard Perry had started a fund, and a lot of the Goldman Sachs alums had, had come out. Um, and so you're starting to see some, some real meaningful f growth. Um, but started there uh, with very small number, and, and it was basically, you know, investing with the early winners. And then you started to see the migration out of Tiger. So you had Lee Ainsley leave, and you had Blue Ridge start, and you had Lone Pine start, and these were not brand names. And in fact, you know, no one was even sure some of these kids were going to make it because they were still pretty young guys. Um, and you know, we backed a number of them very early on, and and became very um, immersed in the whole culture of long short equity and really long short equity now became the place to go so macro which had had its heyday in the 80s kind of started to fade away a little bit into the 90s and then this event driven stuff started to kick in and that whole concept of absolute return and enhanced fixed income really started to grow and that business has, has boomed and you look at firms like Citadel and and others that, that have become you know tens plural of billions of dollars. Uh, but long short equity to me was always the place I wanted to spend a lot of time and focus. And we've always had this desire to be early, you know, to invest with people when they're small and still nimble and uh, don't have so much money that they can't, you know, compete uh, but for a couple hundred names globally around the world. Um, so what we've seen is the biggest change in my mind has been you have the old guard, Right, that still has a decent amount of capital, and the returns are kind of pedestrian and, and more institutional. And as we were talking about earlier, you got the sovereign wealth funds and others that poured money into those because everybody knew them. And of course, you know, you put money in Bridgewater, or of course, you put money in a Goldman Sachs alum, or of course, you put money in Farallon. And I think the return streams have been only okay. Um, and then you had. And there's another reason behind that, I think, is yeah. because as the owners became rich, yes. they want it to look like a bond. Absolutely. Because they just don't want their money to go it's up and down. such a good point. You know, um, the risk tolerance of the owner as his proportion of the capital changes, absolutely changes. And we saw this with Soros, right? When he was originally managing capital, shooting for 40, 50% returns, everybody loved it, but no one was invested. And then some people invested, and they had a nice run. He was making 30% returns. And I remember we got up to about five or six billion and he basically said, you know, guys, I'm already rich. I kind of only want to make 15 and I know that's not what you guys want. So you're going to want 30s. You go chase somebody else. And so he shrunk down and then he still made 30%, but now it was all his money. And uh, then he eventually turned into a family office. But I think, you know, he's unusual. He kept that same level of, of desire and, and risk tolerance, whereas the average manager, you know, when they have $100,000 in the fund, they're going to shoot the lights out because what was $100,000? It doesn't matter. If you got $100 million in the fund, oh, now I need a little bit more safety. If I got a billion dollars in the fund, to your point, I need a bond. I don't really care. Yeah, and I see that. You see these giant hedge fund groups of people I knew from the past were incredible return generators. Yeah. Don't generate returns anymore. Right. And I don't think they want to. And I think the pension fund industry 
that needs bond-like instru- need bond-like instruments. You think, well, okay, fine, I can get out of Brevin Howard or Blue yeah. Crest or whoever it is. No, it's your point. It's it's about liquidity. It's about fixed income substitute. It's about low correlation. And so they've institutionalized the business. Heck, you can't have $3 trillion of alpha generators. You're just not going to have it, right? And it's just not going to happen. So what you've got to have is some number of trillions of dollars of good core diversifying assets. And look, if if I'm a big pension fund and I have a 7.5% actuary assumed rate, all I need to make is 7.5. I don't need to make 15. I don't need to make 25. I need to make 7.5. So if I can do that with some semblance of you know, um, low volatility, and it can be uncorrelated with my equity assets, meaning it doesn't get crushed if we have another, or when, not if, when we have another correction, then that's a positive. But I do think it, it's changed a lot of the nature of the business. And then you've got the other problem with the increased regulation on banks, which used to be playing a big role in hedge funds. You know, everyone talks about there's too much money in hedge funds. I actually think there's not enough. Because what people are forgetting is for every dollar that's gone into hedge funds, probably $2 have come out of the banks, prop desk. So there's probably less money trading the strategies today than there used to be. Yeah, when I was at Goldman, the Goldman prop desk was by far the world's largest hedge fund. By far. Just not, no and one they had close. several prop desks. Yeah, you know, the exactly. macro guys, they had the relative yeah. value, no one special sits guys. I mean, they were huge. Yeah. And, they, and you think about a lot of the alums that came out of there, you know, they benefited by still having their old guard friends still inside the prop desk. So there was a lot of good information exchange. But when you put that Chinese wall, it's, it's not necessarily a good thing, I don't think. No. I, mean, I mean, Chinese wall is the wrong term. But when you, when you put that, that you can't do prop trading, um, it, it lessens the amount of liquidity in the markets. And less liquidity is never a good thing. So do you think returns generally in the hedge fund space have come down as more money's come into it? and more of the pension money's come into it that wants a different return? Yeah, I, 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 I think you're right. And I, I guess I, I couldn't argue, I don't have the, the data to support that, but I, I wouldn't argue with the premise at all. But I would say that, that there's also um, probably a, a flattening out and, and an increasing of the tails. Mm-hmm. So you've got some that I think are benefiting greatly and they're taking advantage of anomalies that exist because prop desks don't exist as much. Uh, and I think there's a lot of people that probably shouldn't be in the business and they're generating poor returns. And, you know, I say that there are, you know, 40,000 hedge funds. And people say, what are you talking about? There's only 10,000. I say, yeah, but we've met all 10,000. They're all in the top quartile. So somewhere there are 30,000 bad ones. <laughs> I've never met a bad one. They're all top quartile. So, but even in the 10,000, the reality number, right? Um, there aren't 10,000 good managers. It's impossible. There's, it's impossible. So let's say there's 1,000 that are you know, really quality. And even within that, there's probably a few hundred. So why do those other ones get funded? Well, hope springs eternal, and some are good marketers, and, and lots, of, lots of reasons. But at the end of the day, you do have to generate good returns. So how do you pick funds now? So now you've got a huge universe. Yeah. As you said, there's a bit of dross in there. Yep. There's a whole group in the middle that you don't really know what to do. How do you, how do you find value in that and yeah, pick the winners? You know, I, I've always approached it the same way, and, and I'm, I'm probably on, if, if, there's, if there's a continuum between quant and qualitative, I'm probably too far on the qualitative, some would say, and not enough on the quantitative. And, you know, but we all have our styles. So I'm, I'm much more on the qualitative side. And, and part of this is, you know, I've been very lucky. I've got to hang out with some incredible people in the industry over a lot of years. And, and I learned a lot, you know, spending time with people like Julian and, and others. And, and so my big thing for, for a manager is competitiveness, right? I'm looking for just people who are competitive about everything. And, <laughs> you know, and I don't mean it in a negative sense. I mean, there's, there's extremes, like where people get so competitive that they have to bet on every shot in a golf game. I mean, that, that, but I'm just talking about people who, who want to win yeah. and, uh, and really hate to lose. Um, and then, you know, I'm looking for a core intelligence, but more I'm looking for intellect, people who are intellectually curious, people who, you know, I don't want the 1600 SAT quant guru, you know, I want the person who's got a little, you know, street sense and a little bit of, of that ability to, to have that second order thinking, 
you know, natural gas prices fall, what does that mean for polypropylene producers? Or what does that mean for railroad, like railroads, you know? There's gonna be more oil produced in the Bakken, there's no pipeline. Well, why is there no pipeline? Well, we can talk about that, but there's no pipeline. Well, someone owns the railroad, so they're gonna ship it in railroad cars. So let's buy the railroads. So that's second order yeah, thinking. Yeah, we call it, well, I call it the knock-on effect. And I think yeah. that's the key to good thinking in financial markets is yes. don't look at the obvious thing. Yeah. Look at what the knock-on effect is. Yeah, and even the knock-on effect of that. Yes. Yes, the third order thinking, yeah. And sometimes that has a much bigger potential move than the major, major thing. Yeah, the ability to, to think one and two steps out is clearly important. And that's what I'm saying. It's more intellect yeah. than intelligence. Yeah. Um, and that street smarts. And then you know, I also am looking for people of character, just unquestioned character and integrity. Yeah. You know, if you cheat on, you know, cheat on golf, you're gonna cheat on me. You cheat on a test, you're gonna cheat on me. So I really want people of, of high caliber and integrity. You know, if you're gonna fudge the number when no one's looking, what about when it's really important? You know, you're gonna fudge a little mark. Oh, it's only a nickel. Well, what about when it's 25 cents or 50 cents? So I'm really looking for, for people who have, who have high integrity. Um, you know, another one for me is, is collaborative spirit. You know, can you work well as a member of a team? Because one thing I, I think I've come to learn is as much an individual sport as this is, it really isn't. It looks like an individual, individual sport and you've got the name brand on the front, but there's always a support team. And if that team doesn't support the leader, I find that you don't get really great results. So you gotta have that ability to, to work with people and, and collaborate with people. So what, if you look back upon some of the hedge funds you invested in the early days, who were the big winners and who did you really screw up with? Oh man, there's both on, <laughs> on, on both sides. So yeah, I said, I, we've been very lucky. You know, we, we, we came into the business at the right time, meaning it was, it was the boom period. And, and so we really, we really did get to invest in, in all the great ones. I mean, you know, we were early investors in Blue Ridge and, and John Griffin, and we were early investors in Lone Pine, and we were early investors in Viking. I mean, I remember, remember the story of, of Andreas coming out of Viking, and he's trying to tell me how, you know, there are going to be three equal partners, but I am the CIO. <laughs> and I'm like, okay, that, that's good. And, and he's going on, he says, now remember, there, there are three of us he's equal partners, but I am the CIO, I run the CIO portfolio. I'm like, okay, I got it, you are the CIO. And that's really important because you understand Viking, he is the CIO, he is the leader, and he's created this structure and this infrastructure like the military guy that he is that allows the team to prosper. But it was very important that they had a single leader and having a three-headed leadership wouldn't have worked. Mm -hmm. But it was so funny listening to say it. But, um, you know, and Ken Griffin, you know, I wasn't there when he was doing it out of his dorm room, but I wasn't that long after. So, and I think I'd say about Ken is, look, Ken is a better trader than all his traders. He's a better accountant than a CFO. He's a better lawyer than a general counsel. He's, he's just better at everything. I mean, the guy is truly dazzling, but he's also built an infrastructure and a team that's second to none. I mean, he has more tech people than most people have investment people. So truly, truly dazzling. But I've had some some real clunkers. Um, what, what were the kind of returns of the before we go to the clunkers? What were yeah. the kind of returns of those guys like Maverick? Because some people won't be familiar with these funds. How did they do? Yeah, you know, you look at at Lone Pine, for example. You know, Steve Mandel. You know, they've compounded close to twenty percent for almost twenty five years. Compounded per year. That's an extraordinary number. And you know, you look at Blue Ridge. I think it's the same number in the low twenties. Um, you know, Citadel, Citadel is, is in the high teens because they had the one bad year in 2008 when, uh, you know, the world was imploding and, and crazy as all the assets they had were not impaired, but the banks were calling the loans to try to seize the assets so they could sell them into TARP and make money. There's something wrong with that, but okay. <laughs> uh, but it happened. And so, you know, these guys have compounded it at very high levels for a very long period of time. And it is very, very hard. Um, but, you know, we've invested with hundreds, plural, of managers over the years. And, and we've had our share of, of really uh, bad ones as, as well, well as really good ones. And I think one of the common characteristics of the bad ones is um, they didn't appreciate the operational 
side of the business. So they didn't spend time having an equal partner come in as a head of operations so they could focus on investing. And I think one of the genius moves of Paul Tudor Jones is having Mark Dalton, who takes care of all the business so Paul can focus on trading. And you know they've compounded again in the teens for coming up on 30 years. Um, but I think the other thing that we, we misjudged was people's ability to not give in to the temptation of size. So you know, when we'd be early with somebody and we'd have good returns and then they'd grow very large, in the private side, I was actually pretty good historically just not doing the next fund. In the public side, we tend to give people a little bit too much rope, too much benefit of the doubt, and that you know, change, as you mentioned earlier, about how their risk tolerance changes and, and the return stream changes. Um, so, so that's been disappointing from time to time. Um, kind of overstaying the welcome. And I think there are examples out there of, of big funds that got to that point, returns got lousy, teams then spun out, and we've been fortunate to invest with those teams over the years, um, which I, I do like that element of this business. It's a, yeah. it's a birth and death thing, <laughs> um, which is kind of fun. And do you look at the hedge fund portfolio like somebody would trade stocks? Because a lot of people don't understand oh, how you do great this. Great point. So you do kind of cut your losers, run your winners, you know, how, do you, how do you think about all of that process? Such a good question. No one's ever asked that question. That, that's, a, that's like a phenomenal question. Because it is exactly like a portfolio, and you should think about it like a portfolio. I think the problem for most people is they don't appreciate portfolio construction. You know, there's four steps in investing. Asset allocation, you know, where am I going to be, what geography or what asset class. Then there's manager selection. You know, am I going to give you capital or am I going to give Steve capital or am I going to give Andreas capital? And then there's portfolio construction. All right, if I pick the three of you, the average person just says one-third each and I'm going to rebalance. Well, why? Well, what if this person is twice as good? So maybe they should get 60 and the other two should split 40. So that's the way we really think about it is that portfolio construction. The last step is security selection. And that's what we're outsourcing when we use an external manager. But that portfolio construction is so important. And we start from a top-down perspective. And it's an art, not a science. It's it? definitely art. It's de Look, people try to quantify it, but you can't because we're talking about human beings. Yeah. We're not talking about numbers on a page. And, and I think a lot of people have tried to quantify it, and it hasn't been successful. But ultimately, you said it, right? We're going to press our winners, and we're going to you know, cull our losers. A lot of people double down, right? And there's this thing, and I tweet this a lot on, on uh, the internet, on uh, uh, Twitter, so at Mark Yusko, right? And I say, hashtag winners press winners, hashtag losers average losers. And there's the famous sign of Paul Tudor Jones sitting under the losers average losers sign at his dorm room or whatever. And it's true, but most people, they buy something at 10, it goes to 5, they want to buy more. Instead of saying, well, I'm just wrong, and I'm going to move on to the next good idea. And Soros says it best, is the only reason I'm rich is because I realize my mistakes faster and correct them and move on to the next good idea. So the same thing is true in, in managing a portfolio of managers is you know, people go through periods where something happens. They get divorced, they lose a child, they you know, get red Ferrari syndrome, where they get distracted. You know, there's a famous story about the guy out in California. He had 17 Ferraris and he had a staff of 10 taking care of his Ferraris. Like, well, why isn't he spending all this time managing my money? Um, or the guy who kept me waiting in his office for an hour away met with his architect. Like, guess what? We're not investing there. So those are real, and, and people do have those experiences, life experiences that impact the way they're going to be able to manage. So we have to constantly be vigilant and understand the relationships we have with the managers. But the other thing we try to do really diligently, and it's hard, it's probably the hardest thing to do in the business, is when a manager that we have a great long-term track record with and, and history with has, has had a, a tough period, we actually will give them more money. So unlike a security where I do want to you know, cut my loser short, um, if I really believe in the manager and I believe they're just their styles out of favor or nothing's changed, I will give them more capital. And conversely, if a manager gets on a big run, okay, I will take capital back because I think the cycle's gonna shift and they'll go out of favor. Now that's different than a security. Like if you have a security, a company that's just executing really, really well, you know, you wanna keep adding to it. And that was one of the things I said that made Julian a great investor is he had this uncanny ability to double up. 
whereas most people double down. So I think it's subtly different in that when we're looking at securities, that winners press winners and losers average losers really works. Um, in managers, as long as nothing's changed, we'll trim our winners and give to our losers. Now, if we think something's changed, either their asset base has gotten too big, they've changed their style, their strategy, or they're going through one of these life situations, then we'll cut and we'll ask questions later. Um, and I think that, that gives us a little bit of an edge because a manager ultimately is a relationship. Right? If you're an allocator and you're giving money to a manager, you have a relationship. And if you support someone in that difficult time, they remember it. And there's usually a symbiotic relationship that you, you benefit from. And how do you look at, I guess you, you're more intuitive and using experience, but how do you look at it when somebody loses money? When do you say, okay, enough's enough, yeah. and I need to question whether your style's out of favor, yeah. or how do, how do you go through that process? Because uh, as a hedge fund manager on the other side, having run hedge funds before, yeah. it's that awful process of never knowing how somebody's going to judge yeah. a bad month. No, no, it, it's, that is the, the $10 billion question. <laughs> and and uh, I don't think we're, we're perfect at it by any stretch of the imagination, but I, I do think your, 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 your word again is perfect. It's, it's intuition, and it's just pattern recognition, and it's 10,000 hours. When I was first doing this, I was lousy at it. I mean, I was really lousy at it because it, you get sucked into the glamour and the media and the hype, and, and you're paying attention to the numbers. And, and I remember going into a manager's office, and I had this spreadsheet that I had done, and I had all the numbers laid out, and, and he just eviscerated me because the numbers were talking about the past and he was talking about the future. And, and it was this epiphany moment of saying, no, 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 what you need to do is be able to evaluate the person and their ability to generate alpha because they have edge. And what is that edge? That edge is either an information edge, it's an intellectual edge, it's a modeling edge, it's a relationship edge. You know, again, one of the things that I think the early hedge fund managers had better than anything is a couple things. One, they were older, right? They started their firms later in life. You know, Julian was 48, Soros was 49, Cooperman was 48. So they had these big networks and these relationship sinks that they could dip into. And so when, when we kind of think about how is somebody doing, one month, don't care. Don't even really know how someone's done in a month. If I see a pattern emerging and there's a divergence from what my expectations are, like when I go into meetings, I don't look at performance. Like if I go in to meet with you, you got five years of performance, I don't even know it. I don't look at it, I don't wanna know. I wanna hear your story. I want you to tell me how you think and how you think about the world. And then I wanna go back and check the footprints in the sand. Because if you tell me you're a growth manager and you underperformed in a period like the last five years, I'm gonna go, well, I don't get it. Whereas if you say you're a value manager and you outperformed in the last five years, I'm gonna tell you you're lying to me. So. <laughs> I don't really want to know a priori what somebody has done. And so when, when we look at, at performance, it's more of a symptom, right? It's like a cough. You have the cough because you're already sick. You should have avoided getting sick. And so we try to cut it off at the pass by staying close to people, getting to know them, understanding where they are in their life. And I mean, but why wouldn't you, if you're giving them money to run, and you have to have your trust and faith, so yeah. therefore, you want to know them. If I'm going to give you money, I, know. I want to know what you're doing with it and how you think about things. There's so many people that show up once a year, maybe, if they're lucky. Or just look at the numbers. Yeah, just look at the numbers. Or, or, or just look at the numbers, <coughs> yeah. And ultimately, the, I think the numbers are symptom, right? They're just, there's something that happened because other things were happening. And we got a good one. Just this morning, we learned that there's a very famous hedge fund that one of the principals, there's really two principals, one of them is leaving. Now, what does that mean? Does that mean that that principal finally has decided they're going to go do it on their own and you know, one plus one will be, you know, they'll raise more money together and they'll still collaborate? Or is it, hey, there's a rift and now it's going to sink both ships? Or what is it? So we're going to have to dig in and find out what's actually going on with that. Is it a divorce? Is it a, hey, little brother, you go off and do this and we'll be better together? It could be many different things. So it's more, I think it's more of a people business than people understand. Yes. Because you know, knowing the business for a long time as well, there was a lot of people who didn't understand that. Yeah. And they were always the best investors, the people who understand who bought into you, your ethos, what you're trying to do, were supportive. And the worst people are the people who just look at your numbers. How did you do the first three months? 
Look, right, I mean, I, right I, now. <laughs> so fun. So I'm at an emerging managers conference, you know, that um, Morgan Stanley always puts on out in the Garden City Inn um, out on Long Island. I was like, why are they doing it way out here? It's because once we get you here, you can't leave. You can't go into <laughs> other meetings in the city, and you're stuck. It's, you know, an hour away. And it was great. And so, but I remember quizzing this guy, and he was a new startup manager, and he basically had made 10 basis points for the first six months, just no volatility. I said, well, what do you have? Well, yeah, I got mostly cash, and yeah, I got a couple positions on, and I said, what are you doing? I said, I can't evaluate I you. And he says, oh, well, I just can't afford to lose money in the first six months. I said, what are you talking about? And this woman from a uh, Swiss fund of funds. I was about to say, it's pump, the Swiss fund of funds she, every time. She jumps up, she says, absolutely, I would never give money to someone who lost money in the first six months. Said, what? How do you know what they're doing? Because how do you know they're not going to lose all your money in the seventh month if you don't know what they're doing? Up until, so I just, I just thought it was, it was a very strange because he's telling you, when you, in the first three months or six months, you're not getting their strategy. No, you have no idea. So yeah, you're, yeah. you're actually investing in something entirely different. Yeah, and so I guess, to, you know, I shouldn't say anything, dis I mean, I, I didn't... You didn't name names. I didn't name <laughs> names and I, and I didn't even know her, but it was one of those things where I shouldn't disparage in the sense that maybe she'd done all the work and actually really knew this guy cold. Sure. It's totally possible. Sure. But what I, what I got from the comment was, all I care about is the numbers. Like, no, you can't just only care about the numbers because the number doesn't give you any information if what we just found out is just sitting in cash. So how, let's say you're a new guy, and I think a lot of people watching this, there'll be a lot of people who want to start hedge funds or think about leaving a bank yep. or whatever it is. What's your advice about that whole process, what they should do, yeah. how they should do? And Yeah, um, I think a couple things. I mean, one, make sure, well, and this is true of, of career and life generally, make sure you have good mentors, yeah. right? I always say, think about the four people you spend the most time with, that's who you'll become. So I like hanging out with you. So, you know, you gotta hang out with people that make you better, smarter than you, et cetera. So that's one. So, and also, by having a good mentor that you can talk about when you're doing a startup, really important, because people will connote your new firm with that person's success. So have that mentor that, and they don't even have to be an investor or a seeder, they just have to be somebody that would vouch for you and your character. Second thing is, um, you know, be honest and be open about what it is you're gonna do, right? If you have something that has edge or you have something that's unique, talk about it. Don't give me the drivel, I say, you know, most pitch books. I can pick the two pages that matter and the other 18 pages throw away because they're all the same. So figure out what those two pages are and really focus on that. You know, what makes you different? What do you have edge? Do you have experience? Do you have knowledge? Do you have relationships that make you more able to generate alpha in the future? I would also say that um, you know, find people that want to get to know you, right? Whether it's you or me or others that, that actually want to know what you're doing, not just send me the numbers and you know, put you in a database and I'll monitor you and six months from now maybe I'll get back to you. That's not interesting. And then finally I would say um, make sure that you solve the operational question first. You know, do you have a good partner that's coming in to take care of the back office and the operations and the infrastructure so that you can spend your time on the investment side and the team management side? Because the biggest difference between going from an analyst who's generating ideas for another portfolio manager and being a portfolio manager is, is harder than you think. And I think one of the big things for me is there are a lot of people who should never become portfolio managers. They should be analysts. Doesn't mean they're less good, but it's like Lee Cooperman says it. He says, there's one portfolio manager at my shop, and that's me. All these other guys, they might be 55, 60 years old, but they're analysts, and they love it because they're the best analysts in the world, but they have no aspiration to be a portfolio manager. So. Think what you're good at and make sure you're not trying to become something that you're not. So if you, if you are a great analyst, right, be a great analyst. If you think you have portfolio management talent, make sure that you have great analytical talent around you and great infrastructure around you so that you can focus on being a portfolio manager. And how about the question that comes up for a lot of people is volatility. Yeah. Because as you know, I mean, we love the kind of old school macro guys who are volatile and we understand yeah. that. Yeah. The lumpy returns, that's fine. Yeah. Um, 
you need to, people struggle where they should fit in the volatility spectrum because they want yeah. to please people as opposed to, this is my product. I Do know. you like Coca-Cola because I make yeah. it or not? But you can't pretend Coke is another product. I know. But they do it. So how does Look, that work? I, I think the challenge we have now is, is Willie Sutton syndrome. You know, they asked Willie Sutton, the famous bank robber, why do you rob banks? Well, that's where they keep the money. <laughs> so I think that's the problem is, yeah. you know, where's all the money? Sovereign wealth funds, big pension funds, big consultants. So what do they want? They want institutional quality. They want big asset base. They want low volatility. They want, you know, oatmeal. Well, the problem with that, if you're a startup, is you don't have a big asset base. You may be able to generate low volatility returns, or so your model tells you you can, but you're not going to get the chance because you don't have the infrastructure, you don't check all the boxes to be big. So where are you going to go? Well, you're going to have to go to a cedar, you're going to have to go to a family, you're going to have to go to the people who want that to take that risk on you as a PM. Now, what do those people want? They want the old school macro kind of returns. They want the lumpy, they want the you know, rough 15, not the smooth eight. Yeah. Right? I want 15, not eight. And you know, Druck talks about this on, on the thing he did on Bloomberg. He says, you know, when we were running back in the early days, you know, our goal was to make 20% returns. Now the goal is to make 8% risk adjusted. What the heck does that mean? Right? Give me 20% returns, guys. And so as a startup, you got to choose. Do you have the ability to get enough capital from somebody, whoever it is, you know, the friend, the cousin, the whatever, to get you to that critical mass where you can check the boxes for the institutions to give you low vol capital? You want to do that? Fantastic. And you know, if you come out from the right pedigree, right? You're coming out of Goldman Sachs, you're coming out of Morgan Stanley, you're coming out of Bridgewater, you're coming, you know, that might work. And that's great. And I don't begrudge those people building those firms because they're going to generate nice, stable returns for big pools of capital. And there is a need for that, those need for that. kinds of returns. Yeah, right? and particularly in the fixed income environment we're in. Exactly. Huge need. Yeah. I mean, why would you own bonds here? Only three things can happen. Two of them are bad, right? <laughs> you can hold them and interest rates kind of stay flat, but inflation comes back and you lose money. You can hold them, that's bad. You can hold them and interest rates go up and you lose money, that's worse. Or you can hold them and we turn into Japan and you make money. And I think that's better, I think, but it doesn't sound very good to me. No. But ultimately, fixed income, I think, is going to be less attractive than equity market neutral, merger arbitrage, and the like. But again, you got to have size to get the institutional capital. So it's a chicken and the egg problem. So you know, if you want to be in the business, I would say go where your edge is. You know, do you have edge in information acquisition? Well, that edge is mostly gone. You know, in the old days, Richard Driehaus, you know, he had it, right? He was the first customer of Bond Edge and News Edge, and he got information before other people. Not illegal information, he just got it faster because he could get it. Now, high-frequency traders get it before you and I will ever get it. Forget it. So it's not about information access. Today it's about information synthesis. Can you determine what's important and what's not important? There's so much not important, and if you can really focus on important and you have that edge, that's a great edge. You know, do you have a modeling edge? That's still possible, not, not as possible, because most of the models have already been thought of, but there's some, I think, enhancements there that you can, you can make. You know, do you have a, a team edge, you know, a fundamental research edge, you know, relationships with companies? I met a guy the other day who you know, was an investment banker in healthcare, so he has, knows all these healthcare CEOs. That's edge, right? Yeah. Again, not insider trading kind of edge, it's just edge. He, he has information, and they're actually investing in his fund, that's a huge edge. So um, whether it's domain expertise or, or a, a better ability to, you know, but, but even the better ability, I was going to say better ability to acquire unique insights, like you know, I was talking to this one manager years ago, and he was the first guy that said Apple would sell a million iPods. Now some people are saying, what's an iPod? <laughs> <laughs> but he was the first one that said they're going to sell a million iPods. And, and I'm sitting like, okay, I'll bite. You know, why do you know that? And he says, well, I pay college kids to go to the stores and talk to the people selling iPods, and you know, we get good information on, on how many iPods they're selling. I'm like, oh, come on. He said, how, why would anyone who's working inside one of those stores share any information on, on sales? He says, are you kidding me? 
You ask someone making minimum wage what they think, they'll talk to you all day long. <laughs> <laughs> it's like they're not, they're not sharing anything that's proprietary or anything that's, they're just talking. They're saying, we're selling tons of these things. And you know, he made lots of money and Apple's been a great story. So, but now supposedly that's expert networks, you're not supposed to do that. And I'm like, what? Well, that's just good hard due diligence, yeah. uh, I think. But um, you know, I think it is a, a trickier environment because uh, you have to be careful about you know, staying on the right side of the line, because it's all about integrity. Yeah, so going back, just looping back now to where we started at the beginning of this conversation, if I, listening to what you're talking about the hedge fund world and, and how I think about it and seeing the returns lowering because people are being forced to lower returns for this bond-like return, it kind of means that there's a whole spectrum of style, which is the higher volatility, high return style, yeah. that is so wildly out of favor. Ah that it probably should be in favor. Brilliant insight, right? Brilliant insight. I mean, and, and that's absolutely the case. That, that to me, it's all about tactical funds today. It's about people who are willing to take calculated risks and, and really get big when they have an edge. And you know, I wrote about this in two letters ago. You know, I wrote two letters ago, I wrote it all about Soros. Last one, I wrote it all about Julian, kind of two of my heroes. And the last one I wrote about Soros is, you know, his big thing about Druckenmiller is, you know, when you have an edge, be a pig. I mean, literally, be a pig. And you could never be too big. And people are like, no, no, you have to be diversified and you can't. No, when you get real edge on something, when you have real knowledge about a sector, an industry, a geography, or an undervalued asset, something that's sold off, and you really get that edge, be a pig. And I think, it's, it's actually a big, been a big change for me in my life and career in that, you know, I started as a fixed income guy, kind of boring insurance company, and I was working for a, 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 a disciplined equity shop. It was actually a quant shop, and we ran models and we picked stocks, quote unquote, we ran models. And then I get into the endowment world and I learn all about diversification and we're going to have a 15% allocation to hedge funds and a 10% allocation to private and a 20% allocation to energy and you know all these allocation percentages and we'd rebalance and and what I've come to in the last couple of years part of it is this shrinking of cycles part of it is the point that you said of of you don't need that many good ideas a year um, now I, I really do believe that it's time to concentrate on what you think are your best ideas and we're doing that in, in our vehicle. We have this hybrid fund that's a mix of hedge funds and a direct portfolio that we run, kind of like the old Soros Quantum Fund. And you know, we allocate to a smaller number of managers that we really, really like, that we think are emerging and a lot of talent. And then we synthesize their best ideas and we double up on their best ideas. Mm -hmm. And it's a great model and it's crushing. Soros has a similar model, still does it exactly. today. And it's a exactly. great idea. Oh, yeah. and look, I don't have a lot of good ideas, but I steal from the best. So. <laughs> and so let's talk a little bit about markets. And you know, let's talk about firstly, the big picture thing, which was where's the, the, the great opportunity yeah. going forward? The big thing, we could, the big secular thing we can yeah. grab hold of. Is, yeah. Do you see anything? Anything super cheap? <sighs> well, okay, I no, mean, there's that's, plenty that's, of that's, expensive that's, things. Well, there's a, lot, there's a lot of questions in there, Ralph. Sorry. <laughs> no, it's, it's all good, but there's a lot of questions in there. So, you know, I think there's only four things that you can own in the whole world. Stocks, bonds, currencies, and commodities. That's it, right? Real estate, not an asset class. You either own the equity of the deal, the debt of the deal, or the land, the commodity. Private equity, common stock, preferred stock, or a convertible bond in an illiquid company. It's still stock or a bond. It's not something different. And you use leverage. So every asset can be broken down into those four, equity, debt, currencies, and commodities. So if we look across those four categories today, I think debt is pretty unattractive unless you're originating it yourself. If you're originating and making direct lending, fantastic business. 9, 10, 11% coupon, one or 2% warrant coverage, two points up front, two points on the back end, 15%, glorious business. But you have to have good origination, you have to be able to underwrite, but good business. Versus traditional fixed income, no, no sweat. I think there are some, some distressed debt opportunities that are starting to look interesting, and I think there'll be more. There was one in energy, and I think there's gonna be a second bite at that apple here coming up. Um, so be patient on that one. Uh, if you look at, at equities, you know, I think if you go around the world and, and break it into the four categories, so you've got the US, you've got Europe, you've got Japan, you've got emerging markets, and even in emerging markets, you've got the commodity countries and the service countries. Uh, some benefit from lower oil prices, some are hurt by it. 
But you know, we think the U.S. is by far the most overvalued. And I'm not predicting a crash tomorrow, but I think we're closer to a crash than we are you know, away from it. Um, so I'm, I'm saying let's be lighter in U.S. equities. There are a couple places within U.S. equities that are still reasonably attractive. Healthcare is interesting. Technology is interesting. But, but overall, we think it's pretty, inexpen- or pretty expensive. Europe, there's some interesting opportunities, particularly like the peripheral European countries and please places where people hate, like Greece. Right? We love yeah. Greece because everybody saying, hates it. I love it. Greece. I mean, but it, because people don't understand it. Or, I think Russia's you know, interesting as well. Russia's it. unbelievably interesting. I mean, look what's... Look, people gave it up for dead last year and now it's up 40% this year and it's just getting started yeah. because it was so cheap and it got really cheaper. Um, so, but buying things that people hate usually is a pretty good strategy, generally speaking. You may, you may have to be patient. You may have to have a longer time horizon, but I think that's the business we're supposed to be in. Um, you know, other parts of Europe, I think, are looking a little pricey, and I'd be a little nervous about the big core countries. But even they, you can't fight the ECB completely. So, you know, having a little bit, if, if I had to choose between Europe core and U.S., I'd take Europe core. And then Japan. I love Japan. I think Japan, over the next decade, outperforms the U.S. two or three X. So not two or three percent, but two or three X. So if the U.S. goes up, you know, twenty percent over the next decade, I think it's going to go up sixty, eighty, a hundred. Um, so I think it's going to be good. Um, Just sorry about Japan, because look, there is the debt thing. We can't pretend it's not there. It's there. My kind of theory on this is, it's kind of price and equity, much like Greece. So even if something really bad happened, my view is yeah. the stock market will probably it may pull back, may have a bit of an ugly sure. time. But it's likely to do really well on the back of that. It's going to do really well. And I think that's exactly right. And, and I think, look, they get their debt problem, and they know they have to inflate their way out. And they're going to do that by devaluing their currency. Just plain and simple. And so 140 is going to be in sight, and then 160, and then 180, and then 200. And it's not going to happen tomorrow. But look, as long as Abe-san sticks around, I'm bullish Japan. Because what this guy, he, look, the Chinese are the best planners. Right, they have you know, well, I guess Sohn at at uh, SoftBank is the best because it's the hundred year plan. But <laughs> but the Chinese are the best planners. They have ten year plans and multiple plans, you know. And and uh, you know, Japan has got this this five year plan under Abe San because he can't be kicked out. So I think that's going to be great. And then you, know, you drop down into emerging markets. Uh, we talked about Russia. We talked about Greece. Saudi looks awesome here. They're going to open up their market. Uh, people are afraid of it because it's the kingdom. <laughs> Great, you guys stay over here and I'll buy it all. Um, but I think it's gonna be fantastic. Uh, we like Africa. We think Africa is an extraordinary, extraordinary opportunity. We could spend a whole yeah, I, day I, I, talking I, I, about Africa. I'm just Africa. thinking I could speak to you another whole oh, couple I know, of no, hours we'll, about we'll, all we'll, sorts of stuff. No, no, here. We'll, we'll come back to Africa some other time. But it, it's, Africa is just unbelievably op- a huge opportunity. Um, and then you, know, you, you look at, at places like China and Taiwan and, and India that benefit from lower, lower oil prices, and I think Oil prices are going to stay lower for a little bit longer than people think because it's this supply shock. And Saudi has basically said, look, it's not just shale. It's shale. It's solar. It's wind. All these things are biting into our lifestyle. So we're going to put the price down to a level where we can dominate and we can control it. And they're cranking up their production, 10.5 or whatever they hit the other day. So I think there's a, a longer term story of them getting back market share, keeping prices lower, and that benefits China Yeah, I think the, oil price, India. the curve flattens, the whole oil price stays a lot lower for a lot longer. There's a brilliant interview with a guy called Diego Pereira yes. um, and on Real Vision, and he yes. just kind of changed my entire outlook. I suddenly yeah. realized that if we do go through an energy bust and they can write off all the energy assets down to zero, all the new pipelines, yeah. the railroads, the ports, the terminals, and yeah. all the other stuff, then all the people who buy those distressed assets eventually, their cost of production is collapsing. Yeah. Well, that's, that's the great thing about Real Vision, right, is, is you can have the big macro stuff, but then you can have the, the laser-focused opportunity to interview somebody that talks just about energy or oil or, or gold or commodity. I mean, and that's what's really cool is you get to piece all these things together to get a, a real macro view. Yeah, and we get to speak to somebody like you and no, hear all of your nice. experience, no, which that's is great. Nice. Mark, thank you very much no, for coming to talk thanks. to us, and we'll get you definitely back again. Always good to be with you, and thanks for having me. Cheers. All right.